thanks and welcome for uh, to uh, welcome uh, to the third of what I hope I hope to be many uh, seminars. Uh, we have four great lectures today. We're going to start off with transgender healthcare. Um, and then we have pediatric uh, sepsis. We're going to have a break, a short break. There's bathrooms down the hall on the right uh, if you need to use those. Um, and then we have pediatric toxicology. And then for our last lecture on pediatric burns, that will be joined by our residents. So it may be a little crowded in here, but we'll make it work. Um, Oh, I just wanted to uh, kind of bring your attention to, I have the PowerPoints in your folders. I also have an evaluation form that I would appreciate you filling out. If uh, you could just kind of give us some uh, feedback about how we're doing, the lecturers, and also the seminar in general. And if you have any ideas for future lectures, I would appreciate that as well. Okay, so if uh, you're ready? Yeah. Okay, this is Andrea. Peterson. She is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner in our Department of Endocrinology and also for the Child and Adolescent Gender Center here. So, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Andrea Peterson. I work in the endocrinology department. I see patients with many different endocrinopathies and uh, as of recent, since September, we launched our uh, Child and Adolescent Gender Center here in Oakland. So I'm one of the four providers in that clinic, and I'm very honored to be here this morning and to be working with this population and to be spreading kind of the word and education to our community about uh, the special needs and care for this population. It's uh, very uh, dynamic. A group of families and kids, and uh, we are seeing such a dramatic, in or dramatic increase uh, in our community. And so, any awareness, as with any specific population, it only provides better patient care in the long run when we have more information and education. Uh, so, I just want to start off by kind of saying that I know that we all probably walked through the door this morning with kind of a different idea about this topic and we all come from different backgrounds and have different opinions uh, for many different reasons and I just ask today that you kind of open your mind and open your your um, your space as you probably do in patient care all the time and try to think about it from you know maybe an angle you haven't thought about it before so that we can just be better providers and that's the goal so um, I don't have any financial or other conflicts of interest to report. And by the way, I'm in no means an expert in this topic. I went to school and got my education uh, in nursing, my graduate education at UCSF, and it really brushed over this topic. I mean, when I landed in endocrinology and found a need for this population, I, I it's kind of been a lot of anecdotal learning and self-learning self and uh, working with a great group of people. So um, if you have any questions along the way, just ask. and. Uh, I'm probably going to misspeak or make a mistake, so I will just accept that and move on. Uh, so our outline today, so I'm just going to do a gender uh, clinic intro so you guys know about the clinic here. I'm going to define gender and do some of the prevalence and risk factors. We're going to talk about transition for, for pediatrics, uh, which is uh, really unique for pediatrics versus the adult world when we talk about uh, gender transition patient rights and medical treatment options. I'm going to do like a brief general case presentation so you can get an idea of where a kid starts and finishes in our medical, in terms of um, the medical piece, and then do some practical application and hopefully have time to answer some people. So our uh, Child and Adolescent Gender Your Center here in Oakland uh, is housed under the Department of Endocrinology. We meet once a month on Wednesday evenings, um, or Wednesday afternoon and evenings. It's a multidisciplinary group that comes together uh, from across the bay uh, at their gender center in San Francisco, which has been ongoing now for, I think, uh, eight years. And so some of the professionals come over here. It's a multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, it's growing so fast. Um, it's Dr. Ivy Aslan, who's the director of the clinic, and then Dr. Alana Shear, who is a pediatrician in the community. Uh, who works with transgender youth at other sites, myself, and then Meredith Russell, who's a nurse practitioner from UCSF Gender Clinic, 
uh, that comes over here. And then our mental health team is Diane Ehrensaft, who is just like a star power in this uh, population. She's written those books down there that you see. Um, it's just fantastic with the families and the parents, especially Dr. Herb Schreier, who I'm sure you're aware of, and he is um, a uh, psychiatrist specializing in uh, transgender care, and then um, a nurse practitioner who works with him, and then Kristen Abacoli, who's our social worker here in the endocrinology department. And then we are doing some clinical research. There's so little research around uh, uh, transgender pediatrics and transition uh, that we are um, doing a lot of research as well. So what is gender? So there's three aspects of gender. So the first aspect is uh, sex or gender biology, and that's your body. So that's basically what's between your legs, your genitals, right? So um, that is chromosomes, uh, sex hormone levels, and it's typically assigned at birth to be male or female. Uh, and then the second one is gender identity, and that's how you feel inside. So that's an internal sense of your being. So that's a, a feeling. So it's not a right or a wrong. It's either I feel like this matches my sex or biology, or it doesn't match. Uh, for most people, it matches. And you, you put how you feel you are matches your assigned sex. But for some people, it doesn't. Um, and so the third one is gender expression. And that's how we express ourselves to the world. So that's how we're dressing. That's how we're acting. That's the toys that kids play with. That's, um, <laughs> Uh, the ways people show their gender by, by, by how they're presenting, okay? And uh, oftentimes, um, we describe these kids when it doesn't particularly match socially, so like a, a boy playing with dolls, right? Or a girl um, who wears baseball caps and doesn't want to wear dresses. We call those children gender expansive, and um, they're exploring, and they're not necessarily transgender, but they're just gender expansive. Um, any questions about that? So those are more like three areas. Okay. So I use this all the time when I'm doing education. So it's like the gender bred person, right? So gender is what's up here. It's how you feel. It's what you think. Um, your orientation and your personal attraction to, to others is what's in your heart. So that's like your, your intimacy and that's completely separate. And then your sex, you know, What's between your legs? What do your genitals look like? So those are the three distinctive differences, and, and they're all very different. Um, so a lot of times people say, you know, kind of mix those things up. Um, like, oh, you know, mix in like being a lesbian or gay with, with gender identity, and it's just completely separate. Um, and then if we do a little activity here, uh, so there's these spectrums, right? And there's your biological sex, so you were born and you were identified as either male or female, and then how, how you identify or how you feel inside as man or woman, and then how you express as masculine or feminine. And for a lot of people, you're somewhere on that spectrum. So, and then for a lot of people, that totally lines up. So for me, for example, I was born and identified as a female. I, my identity is woman, I feel woman, and my expression is mostly feminine. So for me, I really line up along that, that um, right side of the board most of the time. For other people, it's, it's fluid, so it can change, and they have more of like a spaghetti diagram, you know, and you might line up right in the center. So just thinking that this is just fluid um, on all these different levels, and, and um, for most people, it's not always in a straight line on one end of those spectrums. <clears throat> okay. So gender development, so this is like the biggest question I, I always get, like how young are the kids that come into your clinic and you know, um, when do you guys start treatment because these kids are so young, how do they know? Well, gender um, identity develops for most kids around the age of two or three. So developmentally and through you know, what we know, um, your sense of gender starts at a really, really young age. And this is culturally accepted if your gender identity matches the sex you were born with. But if at that time you identify different than what it is um, your anatomy, then culturally there's something wrong, right? That, that this doesn't line up for these children, so there's a concern here. Um, so they must be, you know, they're, they're young enough to know if it matches, and if it doesn't match, well, how can they know? They're, they're too young to know. 
so there's that kind of mindset, um, that shift that we that we talk about a lot to families. Um, so gender expansive traits are really really common. Um, most gender expansive kids are not transgender. So a lot of times um, the kids come into clinic and their chief complaint is being gender expansive, right? I need you to check out my child because you know he's a boy, but he only wants to wear dresses. So there's you know we need to have you know this looked at. Well, most of those kids are just gender expansive, and they grow on. Um, in most of the studies, you know, 80 to 90 percent of those kids grow up not to be transgender adults. Um, and the way that we look at it as health providers is we look at these three statements about identity: are they, you know, insistent, persistent, and consistent? So um, those three things are very different. So are they saying things like "I am," or are they saying things like "I wish," um, "I wish," or "I think"? Um, are they persistent? Like this is this is something that they're insisting or persisting at from a very young age, and is it consistent? Are they coming in and out of it, or is, is this always the same, no matter if they're at school, at home, you know, grandmas, wherever? So we look at those three things very, very carefully. Um, <coughs> so can, some key definitions. Gender expansive, so we've already talked about this. So children who do, do not conform with the culture's expectations as being boy or girl. That's gender expansive. Transgender is when your gender identity doesn't, doesn't match your sex assigned at birth. So you feel different than what's between your legs. And then cisgender, which we use very commonly, is that you're is just somebody who's not transgender. So your gender identity matches your sex assigned at birth. That's a cisgender person. Um, and in terms for transgender children, transgender boy is assigned female at birth, but identifies as male. Transgender girl, assigned male at birth, but identifies as female. And then non-binary would be a child who doesn't identify as male or female necessarily, they're on that spectrum. Um, and then intersex is something totally different, so that's where, where your anatomy um, is, um, um, uh, well, Ambiguous. Interse yeah, intersex between the sexes, right? So it doesn't, it, there's a variation. So you may um, have a combination of body parts, right? But that's a um, disorder of sexual development, and that's completely different. Okay, so prevalence, like I said, there's very little research done, but in, if you look at the whole population, about 0.6% or 1.4 million. Um, the thing, the, the place where the research is mostly concentrated is like outcomes and social outcomes for these kids. So there was a study done in 2006 where more than 600 <coughs> transgender people found that 30% postponed seeking medical care due to pre um, prior disrespect or discrimination. And then 50% reported having to teach their providers about their own health care. And 85 to 95% of transgender adolescents go on to becoming transgender adults. So once you are a trans, once you know, you're not you're not gender expansive, but you are a transgender child or adolescent. Most of those kids go on to being transgender adults as well. Reversal rates are very very uh, rare um, uh, once once treatment starts. Okay, this is a population with huge uh, disparities, um, and 90. So this was a, a study done in 2009, where 90% experienced verbal harassment at school. And most of this harassment and most of these um, feelings of being unsafe at school are re very closely related to uh, expression. So a lot of transgender kids are expressing different than, than male or female, respectively. And so a lot of this um, you know, bullying comes from that. It's just not um, fully acceptable. 66% feeling unsafe, 50% physical harassment, 25% physical assault. Um, and this looks like really grim. They did another study in the bottom right hand corner in this gray um, rectangle over there, which was 2011, and the numbers have improved. And I think that's part of just education and um, you know general acceptance. So it's improving. It's just uh, really scary for these kids that walk through the door. And, and I point this out because I think it's important to know what they're facing in the outside world so that when they come in here to the hospital that we're creating a safe space for them and they're not experiencing all this uh, you know, discrimination that they're experiencing. And then as a result of this, they often avoid health care, they're afraid that people are going to have transphobia, they're going to be discriminated against, um, 
They turn to alcohol and drugs, skipping school because they're not feeling safe, and then significantly lower GPAs. But all of this, <coughs> the scariest uh, numbers for them actually is suicide risk. So amongst this population, 45% have considered suicide, 26% have actually reported attempts. And we deal with this a lot in our clinic, and it's part of the big reasons we have a multidisciplinary clinic for this population, because every kid, well not every kid, but there's, some, there's something going on in the world <coughs> for them that it, at some point along their journey and along their transition that um, can be scary. We need to find that and help them with that and support them through that. So oftentimes, or we attribute these high numbers to lack of family support. So there's sometimes the family's super supportive, sometimes they're not at all. Um, you know, there can be religious barriers. Lack of social or peer support, bullying, abuse, anxiety, uh, increased visibility, and that's with the expressions. They're just not expressing the way they used to, maybe, in part of their transition. Um, substance abuse, and then with puberty for these kids, it's really um, a rough time because then their body starts going through all these changes and a lot of shame associated with that. Um, and if you think about kids, like at school from a very young age, there's these distinctions, right? Boy bathroom, girl bathroom. Boy line, you know, in elementary school, boys line up over here, girls line up over here, um, you know, locker rooms, all these things that are just causing these kids such extreme anxiety when they just don't match or feel like one or the other. So it can be very um, difficult for them. And kids don't grow in a, uh, up in a vacuum as well. So even if the home environment is supportive, if the school environment isn't, that can be traumatic and vice versa. Okay. Um, so we really, really um, look at this closely. So the uh, DSM criteria for uh, diagnosing these kids, actually in 2000 and um, was it 2013, the DSM criteria I believe up upgraded and before it was called Gender Identity Disorder, or GID. Uh, since 2013, it's now called Gender Dysphoria to take away some of that stigma. Um, however, the community is really pushing for it to even be a step further, like gender incongruence or not feeling matched with your body part. Um, and you can see the criteria at the top, and then gender dysphoria is defined uh, as discomfort or stress that is caused by discrepancy between a person's gender identity and their sex assigned at birth. Um, and for the most part, these kids are stable, and it's no small feat given what they face. Um, and when they are unstable, they're unstable in the same ways that many of us are unstable, right? Like anxiety, depression, um, mental health issues. But their gender, I just want to point out, and, and where I take kind of pause with this um, diagnosis, is their gender is not disordered. Their gender is very ordered. It's just not in conventional ways. So for them, you know, we call it dysphoria because it's not you know, conventional, but it, their, their gender, their idea of their gender is just as ordered as my idea of my gender. It's just so, uh, it's just not conventional, and we have such a separation there still uh, culturally, so. Um, so these kids, like I said, are going, oftentimes going through transition, especially pre-puberty, uh, and oftentimes they'll have a chosen gender, a chosen name, a uh, chosen pronoun, they'll have a, an appearance, it can be mixed and matched, so, Sometimes uh, their gender identity is male, but they're still expressing more female, um, why, which is why it's so important not to make assumptions for anyone uh, of what they feel like their gender is. Um, sometimes these kids have a comfort more in between genders, so they're what we call gender, gender ambidextrous. Um, there can be blending, so like a lot of the kids aren't ready to transition socially at school, so like a transgender boy might might present as boy at home, but then when they go to school, they, they have to dress um, as female, more female. Um, and some kids are very dysphoric about this, and some kids aren't, so, so every kid is totally different, and their process is different. Um, and, you know, sometimes a transgender girl doesn't want to, you know, wear dresses and be sparkly. So everyone just has their own process and transition place, and we try to respect that. Um, a lot of parents are going through grieving processes during this um, transition with the kids, and Dr. Aaron Saft works really closely with them to help them understand that, you know, that their challenge is to let go of their own dreams so their children can kind of 
live in their own space. And uh, in many, for many, many kids, the uh, process or the remedy for, for gender transition is, is the actual steps to the transition to, so that they can actually um, express how they're feeling so it feels very authentic to the child. And, and a lot of kids that come in in a really troubled space that haven't transitioned, once they're able to make that transition, it's like, it's so, it's like night and day. Um, it just is really, really life-saving for a lot of these kids to be able to finally express the way they've been feeling for so long. Um, okay, so the common steps of, trans uh, of, of transition for a transgender child is starts with social transition, so this is pre-pubertal, and this is adopting gender, affirming, um, affirming hairstyles, clothing, name. It can happen at any age. It's very reversible, obviously. Then we introduce puberty blockers, and this happens at the onset of puberty, so at 10 or stage two, um, we can start um, GnRH, or gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, um, in early, early adolescence, and this is completely reversible as well. This is the same drugs that we use for children with precocious puberty or starting early uh, puberty too young. We can put their puberty on hold, and then when their peers are, and they're ready to, to to go into puberty, we remove the drug and they um, progress through puberty with, with their peers when they're ready. So it's the same exact drug that we're using. So we're putting puberty on hold for these kids so that they can find a space and, and, and um, do something that's completely reversible before they move into anything that's, that's not reversible. And then uh, we do more gender affirming hormone therapies. So we start the um, puberty of the gender that the child feels um, that they want to transition in, so that's testosterone or um, estrogen. And that typically happens when the child is older, um, and it's different for every child, and it's partially reversible. So some of the changes they're going to see are not going to reverse, some of them are. And then there's gender-affirming surgeries that, that you know you have to be an adult to do. We don't do those here at Children's. And then legal transition, which some kids actually do early on, where they legally change their name and their pronouns um, or their gender on their and obviously that's what we're supposed to Okay, so the hospital has a non-discrimination statement that's been updated recently to include along with other things like not um, discriminating against sex, race, color, ancestry, national origin, language, age, all those things. It now includes gender identity and expression. Um, it's a moral, it's actually a legal obligation to support every child by creating a culture of respect, safety, and support for diversity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many of you maybe have heard of this in the news, but Rady's Hospital recently got sued. A child, a transgender child who was seeking care and, and a patient in the gender clinic there uh, had an emergency and presented to the emergency room. And the staff there would not um, respect the gender or, or would not um, call the child by their chosen name, would not call the child by the pronoun. and were refusing to accept that this child was indeed um, the gender that they expressed. Um, anyway, it was a big mess, and they, you know, we've actually had a couple instances here at Children's as well, but the child actually left and discharged, um, and a couple weeks later committed suicide. And it wasn't as a result of the care they received in the hospital, primarily, obviously, but the family is suing the hospital, not for the death of their child, but for the treatment that they received there, which they felt like was against, they were discriminated against for their gender. So these cases we're hearing about more and more, and learning that you know we cannot any longer legally discriminate against a child's gender. And then our hospital is adopting many different policies right now. We're in the process of doing a ton of education. So this is so timely, and just making sure that when children and families come here for treatment that we're not discriminating against this, that we're not discriminating against anything else, no matter what our personal beliefs are here, that they're able to, to seek the care they deserve. So we are turning, you know, we're really educating about um, making this hospital and, and, um, and our community a gender, giving a gender affirmative care, and that means inclusive, welcoming environment, um, which includes the person's asserted sense of gender. And I know this brings up probably a lot of stuff about you know how we feel personally but when we give health care it's not about <clears throat> how we feel personally so we have to kind of leave it at the door um so yeah our gender affirming affirmative health care environment we have to be 
gender affirming, affirmative health care providers. Um, and this can be a matter of, of life and death um, for kids. So I'm going to present you with a challenge here for just a second. Um, do you have any gender biases? I'm just, I don't know. And I remember when I started working in this population, I did. I had a lot of assumptions and a lot of biases. And so um, part of part of working through that and giving good care is recognizing that in ourselves so that we can, you know, um, watch watch what we're doing. And then do you have experience working with transgender patients or families? Is your workplace environment gender affirming? Do patients feel like they can come in and affirm the gender they feel? Are, are there things on the walls that welcome gender affirm, uh, that are gender affirmative? Um, are we creating this environment? Are we asking when patients register, are we saying, what name would you like us to use today? What name can I call you? And that, that isn't just transgender, that's anybody, right? Like, my mom's name is Susan, but no one's called her Susan since she was like two. So, you know, if, I think it would be really respectful for her to come in and seek health care and say, what name would you like us to use today? What name can we call you to respect you? And this, you know, obviously rolls over for transgender people because often their chosen name is very different and, um, um, than what they were born with. But are we asking that? And are we sensitive to their needs? So I don't know if this is going to play. Oh, look at my slow video. This was a family um, that I was just going to show you uh, a parent perspective when their child <coughs> was starting to signal that they were gender expansive and they're kind of how they how they had to overcome their own personal barriers. So <coughs> that's okay. You just put the mic by the by the computer. Put your mic by the computer. Uh, which one? That we have one. Yeah. Put that by the computer. It'll
also born in the Ah! <laughs> Over the Valley Tutu, over over the Christmas clothes in hindsight.